checking out the stats in baseball, wondering how good would Ted Williams be if he were hitting today? You know, the greatest hitter of all time said his greatest thrill of his long career was to win an All-Star game for the American League. Now, the 1980 Baseball All-Star game matched up two starting pitchers who could not have been more different. Baltimore Steve Stone, now a broadcaster for the Chicago Cubs, was a fastball-turned-junk-ball pitcher who'd been pretty mediocre until his 10th season, 1980. Houston's James Rodney Richard, commonly known as J.R., stood 6'8 and threw hard, very hard. His fastball had been clocked as high as 100 miles per hour, and in each of the past two seasons, he'd struck out over 300 batters. The 1980 All-Star Game was being played at Dodger Stadium in Chavez Ravine, and Richard and his National League mates were looking to win their ninth All-Star Game in a row. What makes this film extra special is hearing the commentary from legends Pee Wee Reese and Bob Feller, who used to crank it up at 100 miles per hour himself. This is my seventh game, seventh, seventh, game. Uh, seventh in a row as a starter, and it's, it's going to be quite an honor, especially here at Dodger Stadium, to be able to play in front of our fans. Steve Darby, the All-Star Game's star of the 70s. You went out here and you threw the ball real hard, and it was, it was pretty easy for you, but uh, i got to trick these guys today. The National League are good fastball hitters, but I'm going to have to dazzle them with my footwork. And kicking off the 80s with his first All-Star appearance, Steve Stone. As the day begins, fans approach with high expectations. By night's end, they'll leave with heroes to remember. The 1980 All-Star Game. With special guest stars, Bob Feller and Pee Wee Reese. As the mid-season classic enters its sixth decade, two heroes of an earlier era, Pee Wee Reese and Bob Feller, are on hand to compare the new heroes with the old. And I, of course, uh I say, reading about you since I was a little kid, Bob. Oh, yes, Pee Wee. Uh, we were both 17, as you may remember. <laughs> That's the Pee Wee Reese I remember. When the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn, Pee Wee was the team captain and a perennial National League All Star shortstop. Reese's first All Star appearance was in 1942, but his contemporary, Bob Feller, was named an American League star in 1939. At the ripe old age of 20, Cleveland's fireballing feller answered a call from the bullpen in the sixth inning of the seventh All-Star game with one out and the bases loaded. On his first pitch, feller got Archie Vaughn to ground into a double play and became a hero. In those days, the American League dominated, and now feller wants more of the same. I'm really pulling for the American League. I'm really serious. It's about time we win one, and I hope you can do it. Thank you. You know, the guys that are out here don't know about eight-game losing streaks, so it's a new team this year. We've got some good young ball players, and I think this is going to be the year that we're going to beat the National League. Pee Wee checks on the National League mood with Bill Russell. Oh, do you get a little nervous before these things start? Sure. I always do. No matter, I do, yeah. no matter how long we played. Meanwhile, both managers seem quite relaxed, and the fans are enjoying the show on Diamond Vision the Dodgers' new scoreboard of the 80s. Earl Weaver enlists the help of American League honorary captain Al Kaline, whose National League counterpart is Roy Campanella. Former All-Star heroes are not forgotten in this bastion of baseball fever, and autograph seekers pursue Pee Wee Reese and Bob Feller, even as the National League's James Rodney Richard of Houston warms up. There's one feller here eminently qualified to rate this fireball. My opinion is that Richard is uh, an overpowering fastball. He can throw a by a lot of hitters. I think Ryan probably throws a little harder than me, or at least did. And uh, I know Walter Johnson threw harder than all of us. Is that right? Well, I think Walter Johnson was by far the fastest pitcher baseball's ever had. But J.R. may just be the fastest around today. And the National League is hoping that Richard's heat and catcher Johnny Bench's cool can melt down the bats of the American League. Willie Randolph leads it off. Richard seems to have everything under control. To Davey Lopes, and one second baseman gets another. In his first All-Star appearance, J.R. Richard survives the top of the first unscathed. And it's on to another debut. The Baltimore Orioles 32-year-old Steve Stone, a 500 pitcher in nine previous seasons, proves you're never too old to dream. 
Davey Lopes is one of four Dodger starters, and Stone knows he's a dangerous leadoff man. But there's that larcenous Yankee at the hot corner. Greg Nettles steals another base hit, and he has Bob Feller raving. I saw him play with Cleveland. Also, I'd seen him play in the World Series. He can play that third base. Uh, only, only better one I ever saw was Brooks Robinson. He's right next to him. Bench hits a shot to third. Robinson makes the play. Another dazzling play by 11-time Gold Glove winner, Brooks Robinson. Let's have another look at Nettles fielding Jim in the bottom of the first. My dentures always fit fine. I never thought of them as a problem until I saw the video of my son's wedding. It was then that I decided to try Fix-A-Dent. Because Fix-A-Dent adjusts to the unique contours of your dentures and gums, forming a thin, powerful seal for a better hold than you ever thought possible. It was like a whole new feeling, so snug and secure. For once, I actually forgot that I even wore dentures. So now, I like what I see. Find out for yourself what it feels like to Fix-A-Dent and forget it. Sluggers are at it again. Now it's time for the event where it's not about the pennant. It's not about the ring. It's about bragging rights. Who will win a 1999 Century 21 Home Run Derby? Tomorrow at 8, only on ESPN. This is ESPN Classic. Nettles starting for injured George Brett takes his cuts in inning two. Ken Reach makes an easy one look hard. With two down and Ben Ogilvy on with a walk, Richard faces another of the four Yankee starters. Shortstop Bucky Dent. Ogilvy's off for the pitch. A perfectly executed run and hit. There are runners at the corners. But the batter is Steve Stone, who hasn't had a base hit in years. Before the game, Jr. tried to strike a deal with Stone. You throw me fastballs, and I'll throw you fastballs. Stone replied, you crazy? I can't even see your fastball, let alone hit it. Thanks, Trent. <laughs> the side is retired, and so is Richard, who bows out after working two scoreless innings, giving up only one hit, striking out three. King Richard gets the royal treatment from his National League mates, who again are set down in order in the second inning. Another hometown hero working for the National League, and none other than Reggie Jackson waiting in arms. A rematch of the dramatic confrontation in the 78 World Series, but this time Welk seems a bit gun shy. He wants to throw me a good ball for it to hit. Three and one, three and two, six. Yeah, I want to bring back the memories. Memories indeed. Top of the ninth, full count, two away. Dodger rookie Bob Welch trying to preserve a four to three lead. The Yankees have two men on. Jackson swings and misses. The ball game is over. An incredible finish. Welch surrendered a homer to Jackson later in that series, and now, with Rod Carew on second, he isn't taking any chances. Ball four skips by as Carew goes to third and Jackson to first. Again, the American League has a rally going, and this time, there's powerful Ben Ogilvy at the plate. The Milwaukee Brewer left fielder is in his first All-Star game, and he'd like to make it memorable. Welch 
Welch's second strikeout kills the American League threat, and it's still nothing to nothing. The 51st All-Star Game is a pitcher's delight up to now, as unlikely hero Steve Stone continues to baffle the National League. straight outs and now Stone needs only one more for three perfect innings. Fans are starting to wonder if the pitchers have an unfair advantage. I'll tell you one thing it's difficult to hit in the All-Star. Now I know you see some high scoring All-Star games like you all won in 1946 you won it like 12 to nothing or something like that. But as a rule when you get those pitchers knowing they're going out they're only going to pitch three innings. They can give it they can go all out. Another factor in the pitcher's success is the starting time of this affair, which makes the shadows long and puts the batters in the dark. This twilight dilemma isn't new to the All-Star game, though. In Anaheim 13 years earlier, the best batters in the world struck out a record 30 times in the long shadows of a 15-inning marathon. As sundown approached, a dozen pitchers got used to the breeze of a waving bat. It was an epic pitching duel where even Hall of Famers looked overmatched in the early California Eve. Pitchers were the heroes in 67, and in Dodger Stadium 1980, it looks to be a repeat performance. have struck out 11, putting them ahead of the 1967 game's record pace. So the question is, are things going to get better for the batter? Swing music is back. And everybody's dancing to Swing America, the 42 biggest hits of the Swing Era, guaranteed to make you jump, jive, and win. Then now the company jumps when he plays Reveille. He's the boogie-woogie bugle boy of Company B. You'll get the great big bands, the legendary singers, and those fabulous songs. Good night. This is the definitive collection. Everybody swing. Louis Armstrong, Woody Herman, Cab Calloway, Mel Torme. Get out of here and get me some money, too. I ain't got nobody. That, that old black magic has me in its spell. It don't mean a thing if you ain't got Swing America. Here's how to order. To order, call the number on your screen or send check or money order. Two CDs, $26.99. Two cassettes, $21.99. Rush delivery available. Swing America is not sold in any store. What influence did the NBA legends of yesterday have on the stars of today? Find out on Vintage NBA. Thursday, NBA star Vin Baker looks back at the career of the big redhead, Bill Walton. Vintage NBA, Thursday at 8 on ESPN Classic. This is ESPN Classic. Rod Carew, named an all-star for the 14th straight year, faces Bob Welch with two out in the top of the fifth. Still nothing, nothing. Carew's perfect day continues, but let's take a look at what he did earlier. In the first, he walked and then took off for second. Carew's third all-star steal. Then, in inning number three, the man with the Major League's highest lifetime average went to the opposite field. 
Scott Carew's performance here reaffirms his place in the pantheon of baseball's greatest performers. He's got to be one of the top ten great hitters of all time. Whenever you lead the American League uh, six or seven times the way he has, and you notice he'll hit one ball to right field, he hit the ball out here while I go to left field for a double. He, you just don't know how to play him. You don't know how to defense him. How would you try to pitch a guy like that? He'd be very difficult. Uh, uh, probably try to throw sliders right on his fist like I did to Williams, and I didn't have much luck with him either. National League pitchers hadn't had much luck with Fred Lynn of the Boston Red Sox, batting in the fifth with two out and Carew on first. And there it is. Going, going, it is done. Fred Lynn puts the American League on top with a two-run homer. In six big league seasons, Lynn's been an all-star six times, and he's now hit three all-star homers, a figure topped by only two other all-star heroes, Stan Musial and Ted Williams. The scoreboard up there says that the American League's got a two-run lead. You feel pretty happy about that. Oh, yeah. Now. If the game was over now, we'd, we'd have a winner. I just want to remind you of something. You remember last year up in Seattle? I was there. Fred Lynn hit a home run in there to put the American League out in front, too, I think, uh, in the first inning. Then he left the ball game. So you wait. National League going to come back here. Bottom of the fifth. The National League still hasn't had a base runner. The Yankees' Tommy John has retired five straight and now faces Cincinnati outfielder Ken Griffey. Griffey sends one to the fattest part of the park. Al Bumbry in pursuit. Home run. Having been just another cog in the big red machine for too long, Griffey is buying for top billing now, and the national exposure won't hurt a bit. National League fans are breathing a bit easier now that the ice has been broken. But the home team still trails two to one, with the Cardinals Ken Reitz up next against Tommy John. For the second straight time, Reitz grounds to second base, but Willie Randolph has double trouble. Catcher Darrell Porter makes Reitz a sliding duck at second, and the Redbirds' third baseman dusts off his first all-star memory. With the stakes increasing, National League skipper Chuck Tanner shuffles the deck. Here's going to be Royce and Knight's spot. Knight will bat nine. Oh, what a memory that name conjures up for Dodger fans. Royce needs one more. North gets it back to Royce. To Garvey. A no-hitter. Jerry Royce has just pitched baseball's first no-hitter of the 80s. Retiring the last 25 Giants, Royce has a no-hitter. Jerry Royce, only 11 days after that heroic performance, is now trying to no-hit the American League. Darrell Porter is down on strikes. Buddy Bell is strikeout victim number two. And up steps Tommy John, who's probably wondering where, oh, where is the DH when I need him? The side is struck out, and Jerry Royce rolls on. With the sun down, the lights are now on in Dodger Stadium. Tommy John prepares to pitch in the bottom of the sixth. It's nighttime for the National League. Chuck Tanner's got his righty-lefty strategy in place, and night delivers. The National League has a runner board with one out. And one of last year's October heroes, the Pirates' Phil Garner, steps in to face John. What might have been a double play is a single. Knight stops at second, and the American League smells trouble. In the top of the sixth, Earl Weaver let Tommy John bat, even though the National League had seven straight right-handers slated to hit. Now, with two runners on, Weaver's going to let his southpaw pitch to another righty. George Hendrick of the Cardinals. Hendrick's soft liner has tie game written all over. Knight scores the National League's second run. It's two to two, and a grandstand critic voices an opinion. Well, Pee Wee, I hate to second guess, but uh, I might have made a change if I were a little, uh, if I were Weaver a little sooner, but 
Tommy John pitching to Hendricks, who's about the hottest, as the hottest year he's ever had, and to get in a right-hand pitcher uh, against him when he had a chance for a double play. Of course, they still have that. Ball game's all tied up. They got one runners on first and third, one man out. Farmer now has to show his stuff. I don't know whether it's best to bring him in or bring in the uh, I'm just glad I'm not sitting in the dugout making the guesses over there. That's right. You only get one. Ed Farmer is Weaver's guess, the American League's leading fireman with 17 saves. It's sweaty palms time for the White Sox stopper, who enters with the game on the line. And waiting impatiently at bat is Dave Winfield. Willie Randolph boots a double play ball, and Phil Garner comes in to score the tiebreaker. The second error that uh, Willie made was that. He went one really hurt, too. That gave him the, gave him the go ahead run. And now the American League has to come back again. Well, what I wonder if, if the American club, these fellows out here playing right now, what if they think about that? Here it is again. We jump out in front, and they get one run, oh, and they right. get another run, they get, they tie it up. Do they start thinking, well, here they come again? I would imagine. I would imagine it's been talked about and they're written about and for so long now that the American League players have to be aware of the situation. Uh, I just hope to live long enough to see the American League win one. You know, I'm 61 years old now, but... Uh, By comparison, 39-year-old Pete Rose is a youngster, but he's still the oldest among the 1980 All-Stars, and after Keith Hernandez singles to load the bases, Rose comes in to pinch hit against Farmer. It's all-star game number 13 for Rose and game number one for Farmer. This time, the new beats the old as Willie Randolph finally gets it right. Double plays, and the American League is out of the jam, trailing by only one. But in the bottom of the seventh, Pete Rose's former teammates run circles around the American League. Ken Griffey leads a red scare against Blue Jay pitcher Dave Steve. The Reds' attack gives the National League a 42 lead. The Americans are close to nine straight losses. The store is now closing. Please make your final collections. Thank you. If you have thinning hair, call 1-800-HAIR-CLUB now, and we'll send you our new 40-page hair loss update. It covers the most up-to-date information on Hair Club's most natural-looking, non-surgical hair development to date. You won't believe some of the hairstyles that you never thought you could have again that are now attainable through this method. So whether you're brushing your hair back, coming out of a pool, or just roughing it up, it looks and feels just like your own hair. Remember, call 1-800-HAIR-CLUB now and get your free booklet. That's one 800 Hair Club. His grace on the field can't be matched. His contributions can't be missed. His homers travel 450 feet. His support goes even farther. Major League Baseball Charities has teamed with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Together, we're giving kids a world of opportunities. He has the drive to be a big leaguer, but hasn't forgotten what it takes to be a little kid. This is ESPN Classic. 
Only ESPN Classic lets you pick what you want to watch Sunday nights. Just log on to ESPN.com on the Go Network and vote for the week's classic click and pick event. This week, click Choice 1 to see the comebacks of the magnificent John Elway, including his first Super Bowl victory. Click Choice 2 to see Michael Jordan drop 55 in his post-retirement garden party. Log on for even more classic click and pick choices. Then tune into ESPN Classic next Sunday at 7 to see if your pick is the classic click and pick of the week. It's only on ESPN Classic. This is ESPN Classic. Now you're going to see if the American League has any character right now. Well, they got two more innings to come back, and they can do it. Comes Bruce Souter in. Oh, he's tough. That Souter is really tough. That ball just dropped down when he pitched it just like it was fall off a table. He's about the greatest relief pitcher I've ever seen. Al Bunbury looks undaunted, but the Souter mystery remains unsolved to American League batsmen. Ken Landro of the Twins thinks he's got a clue. But Dave Winfield sends him back to square one. Why, it's a crime the way this suitor picks on American leaguers. Maybe Al Oliver can bring some truth and justice to the American League way. Well, it seems that Souter is still at large. Suter has been the winner in the last two uh, All-Star games. They only have one more inning to go. I think you may be in a little bit of trouble. I realize we're in trouble, but he certainly is uh, well, he's not unhittable. I'd like to see a fellow like Williams uh, come up and see how it's headed hit him. You don't have Williams right now, though. No, you that's, can't bring him. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Would you settle for Bobby Gritch? With two out on the ninth, the Angels' second baseman is the American League's last chance. In five and a third All-Star innings, Suter has yet to allow a run, but there's always a first and a second. A single the home run is all tied up. I've had it happen to me. Suter loses Gritch on four straight pitches, and now with a runner on first, the potential tying run will come to the plate in the person of Detroit Tiger catcher Lance Parrish. American League fans are clinging to this one final hope. And Parrish, in his first all-star at bat, has a chance to become a hero. It's that time when fans jog their memories, recalling those special occasions when a seemingly decided game turned around at the last possible moment. Bruce Souter has been here before. The count is full, and the runner will be moving. So it all comes down to this pitch. Parrish goes down swinging. And for the third straight year, Bruce Souter figures in a victory for the National League, this time 4-2. to two. It's a familiar scene, one which the National League would like to rerun for years to come. He threw one right by him. Yes, high, high fastball. Yeah, he threw him right by him. Well, we want another one. Well, anyway, it's been nice to be with you. It's a great game. I've enjoyed it. To the hero go the spoils of victory. And so the game's MVP award goes to Griffey. The honor bestowed on the 30-year-old outfielder by Commissioner Bowie Kuhn places Ken Griffey atop the list of this year's all-star heroes to remember. <laughs>